Welcome back, friends. This week we have Paul Biddle. Paul and myself come from similar stock in the sense that a big chunk of our perspective was cultivated over four years with the help of the same few lectures in our course, English Media and Culture Studies in IDT Dunleary. But now Paul is a practicing counselor who holds the majority of his sessions online. And during this conversation, we cover the state of Irish mental health services, what Paul would recommend if one was struggling in the midst of one of these services, along with some of his favorite modes of inquiry and practices that have worked for him as well as his clients. Paul is a warm soul and it was a true delight to have him on. If you'd like to learn more about Paul or his work, please see the link below. Enjoy my friends, take it easy. Hello friends, welcome back to the podcast. This week we have Paul Bidolf. This Welcome, welcome, Paul. What's the crack? Thank you so much. Always a tongue twister to say that last name, and always when I've got to explain as well. <laughs> yeah. But you got it. You got it. Uh, you know, things are lovely, you know. Totally dragging me away from a lovely, beautiful day outside, but you know, I don't mind too much. You know, that was my intention. I was waiting yeah. for a sunny day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, of course. You know, it's all right. I, I can just watch the enjoyment outside and just be fine. <laughs> um, oh. I guess uh, just before I ask you to say a bit about yourself, I should say that we are here due to the the magic that is uh, the magic from a person that we hold very dearly, which is uh, Kelly. Kelly, who who taught us both in in IDT in the EMCS course, English Media and Cultural Studies. Um, shout out to Kelly. I know she listens sometimes, and I guess yeah. Um, I know we've talked off air about how important you thought the course was for your profession uh, and your ability to relate to clients now. Um, but yeah, I guess it, I, it's the most difficult question we ask everyone, but a bit about yourself, but also we'd love to hear, I'd love to hear like your, your thoughts on the course. Cause I think there are some former, uh, former students, former alumni listening oh, also. Alumni. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, absolutely. Shout out to Kelly. And I'm totally going to reply soon, sending me reams of messages and I need to reply. Um, <laughs> yeah, actually an interesting thing, like, you know, cause big question, where do you start when it comes to a bit about yourself? And I think starting actually where that course was, uh, cause that's where you kind of find yourself in your first college university. Uh, like I still remember kind of, mm-hmm. you know, being told, you know, this is where you find your friends for life. This is where you find yourself. And part of that was true. Okay. Mm-hmm. Cause you know, everyone goes their own separate ways, obviously. Uh, but the course itself, a, you know, you don't know what you're kind of getting into at the start, a uh, bit of English literature, but the cultural stuff is just eye opening. Okay. It's like someone just wrenches open your mind and just exposes it. And you just take everything in. And each day you go in, whether it was with Kelly, Maria, Grania, you just didn't know what you were getting, you know. And <laughs> coming out sometimes shell shocked, absolutely, you know, <laughs> going through the trenches a little bit, depending on who you had. But every moment it was a cherished one. And I would always say this. Uh, I said it to the careers office in IADT before uh, I'd be recommending anyone doing that course to have gone into mental health care uh, because, you know, what underpins, you know, the profession so much is an understanding of uh, like gender, sexuality, race, uh, ethnicity, a lot of kind of like mm. different socioeconomic uh, like, you know, issues and culture as well, cultural sensitivity. It comes part and parcel. I would always say that, for those of us in the counseling profession, it is not enough to just simply say that we are open and accepting. We have to understand and be educated too. So mm. it's a nice synthesis between the two courses, an accidental synthesis. Um, because when I finished college uh, in EMCS, it was during the first, well, the first of my lifetime uh, recession. Uh, so I couldn't actually get employment. Uh, I actually wanted to be a journalist, would you believe? Um, couldn't get employment. Mm. Uh, so I ended up following like a lot of my uh, family members into bank uh, banking. Um, I remember my first and last day there. That's about it. I looked in the mirror for about two years and I did not know who that person was. I was wearing a suit and tie, still have it. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't fit. And I mean, both physically and emotionally, uh, <laughs> because <laughs> it definitely doesn't fit after COVID anymore. Um but it was in banking where I actually got into counseling. Um, so 
I was trained as part of like a resilience first response kind of group. Uh, anyone in distress on the phone, they could be transferred to a member like myself. And we would take over contacting emergency services, keeping the person in distress on the line until a family member could be contacted or someone from the emergency services could reach them. But it just so happened that my trainer from Accenture, oh. yeah, uh, my trainer from Accenture basically just said to me, like, after the training, just said, you do really well in this industry, you know, because I just loved it. And, you know, I did my research. Uh because of the long commute uh, and, you know, working ridiculous hours, I had no life. So I had money to spend. Uh, you know, that's that's how you trade to save these days is to actually give up on actually enjoying yourself, I think. Um, definitely true for a lot of mm. us, actually. Uh, spent it, mm-hmm. you know, resigned and, you know, went back to an old job in a restaurant, you know, just happily you know serving coffee you know it was a nice change as well just getting back to kind of like you know being around people um yeah so went back did four years with ICAS uh they're based out in Limerick that's the Irish College of Humanities and Applied Sciences and you know I did it over in Griffith College in Dublin uh met a lot of wonderful people on that course and you know a lot of good lecturers on that too uh you know, it was always a toss up. you know, which counseling course was going to. I knew a few friends were in the industry, but I was happy with my choice in the end. Uh, four years of that, very intense. Absolutely. You know, did not, I always say to someone, uh, when it goes back to returning to academia, you either have too much self-esteem, too much money or too much sense. And you need to get rid of all of it. So that's what happened <laughs> basically. Uh, okay. but yeah, um, that kind of broken down, remade again, you know, just as it was in EMCS, broken down and remade. And a lot of kind of, like, you know, bits and bobs kind of like mix and matched, you know. Um, yeah, uh, up until recently, I was kind of like working in Dublin. I was doing like, you know, work uh, as a training counselor over in uh, Technology University Dublin. Uh, loved my time with students there, you know, because student care was always something that's at my heart. And like, you know, doing class rep back in IADT, you know, it was brilliant because we were training, like, you know, first response signposting as well for students as well, just where, like, you know, where to take them if they need support and all that kind of stuff. We knew our stuff. But, you know, a very exhausting job as well because very difficult to separate, you know, that care I had for student well being. And to be separate as a counsellor too, one of the main reasons I left the position uh, was, well, because it was a bit of a draining one. You know, I loved working with students, uh, doing work on identity, uh, with gender, uh, sexual health. Like, But at the same time, though, I couldn't help but get frustrated, you know, when someone wasn't getting the resources that they needed or were coming, you know, completely Mm -hmm. overwhelmed. So... It was a big decision to do so. And, you know, accidentally with lockdown, ended up stuck over in the UK with my partner. It was going to be a move anyways. Uh, so I ended up staying here, going self-employed. And that's where I'm at today. A, a remarkable job at, at giving a bit about yourself there, Paul. Fair play. <laughs> Very yeah. succinct. And I feel like you've hit, you hit, hit some big points as well. Yeah. Just, just on IDT and EMCS for me, I just wanted to say as well, I feel I, I, I graduated in 2016 and I felt that on reflection now, I'm internally grateful for the course, but even for the people that I met, for it expanding how I looked at the world and how I looked at like how I wanted to contribute in society and m- my my perspective on, on culture, on, on gender, on post-colonialism, these things that I see now over the last maybe three or four years are getting huge attention on, on social media that n- didn't really get before. And I feel lucky to have had the grounding that we got from our lecturers during those years because I feel there's a part of me thinks a lot of people are getting a little, I don't know, it's very easy to get a little overwhelmed or a little lost when all of this is coming through uh, a social media approach or through a social media funnel, if that makes sense. Whereas we got it, you know, with readings and discussions and it helped me personally just be at ease with uh, with the difficult conversations that are now very much to the forefront, which is great. But I 
I don't know if I would have been at the place I'm at now with these discussions had I not had that grounding. So w- what you said really resonated and I just wanted to share that. And thanks to everybody at EMCS and IDT for that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you, so you mentioned you're currently in the UK and I, I, w- I want to talk about your work as a, as a counselor in the UK right now working on for yourself. Yeah. First, you're currently working as a counselor and I feel like the average person thinks they know what a therapist is and what a counselor is and if there's a difference and what if there's a difference what's the difference and it would be great if you could just clarify this for the average listener because like i would just love to for the clarification as well sure it wasn't so long ago i was clarifying this uh for my sister as well okay Uh, you know don't, don't come from a perfect family where we're not touched by mental health god love us you know like i like a number of my family members obviously need support as well so explaining this has always been useful and including like my own partner's family as well you know that's very close to home being there and supportive so uh i suppose the big difference uh difference between counseling and therapy okay most definitions you'll find online talk that counseling is short term and therapy is long term uh so you know when i talked about this with uh, like a number of my colleagues because it was an interesting question it's not one that i often thought about uh, because whenever, like whatever the case was, when someone walked into me, I wasn't thinking about how long that they would be attending. It's up to them. It is the onus of the person. You know, they know themselves. You know, whether they're making progress or how they're doing or how often they want to come. So, you know, it whether it's short term or long term, it folds into one. It's as long as they need it. So I wouldn't see there being a huge difference. Time is the best factor there. But I suppose just more directly, you know, the kind of role of a counselor, you know, a lot of people think it's just listening, um, being attentive, you know, showing, you know, unconditional positive regard and compassion. Compassion being the interesting word there because it's often misused. Uh, I'll get get to that. Don't worry. I'm not just going to forget a point. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) We're totally going to get back to that. Um, It is a bit more than that. A counselor is almost like a guide. Uh, I would always say to like my clients for that singular moment that we speak, a uh, bit of a tabula rasa, blank slate, where they can just throw whatever it is at me. Doesn't matter what the world is outside. Okay, for that hour that they have, or that thirty minutes that they have, they have me, and I'm there. And it doesn't matter what they're going to say. I'm going to be there, and we're going to talk about it. We're going to work things out rationally. We're going to explore, or if it's just a space where they need to vent, that's what it is too. A lot of people use a session for different things, but a counselor is basically a facilitator, like a sounding board, just for someone just to kind of like, you know, connect in with themselves and not feel alone while doing so. You know, many of us, when we're exploring ourselves, get trapped almost like in a maelstrom of thoughts that just don't get anywhere, you know. So that's the other side of it too. You know, counseling is just having someone there who's going to be supportive and explore with you what's going on. That's great, Paul. That's perfectly clear for me. And I believe it will be for the listeners. Appreciate that response. Mm -hmm. And we we talked a bit before recording, and I do want this podcast to be very positively focused, but I can't, we can't help avoid the conversation of highlight or we can't avoid the elephant in the room, which is Irish mental health services. Yeah. Um, and yeah, w- without getting too bogged down in it, I, w- I think the listeners would really appreciate, and I would, to hear your thoughts on why the Irish mental health services are lagging behind even the UK, as you said, because you mentioned off air that per person, Ireland has more counsellors than, than the UK. Mm. But yeah, it, it feels like mental health services are more out of reach for the average Irish person than in the UK. And yeah, I just... I'd just love to hear your experience and why you feel there's such a discrepancy. Yeah. One of the things that uh, like would be quite commonplace when I was kind of going through the services myself, like training up, was the fact that we do have a very saturated market in terms of counsellors working privately in Ireland, okay? Um, so I wanted to compare uh, our, like, you know, the Irish service to our closest neighbour, of course, because, you know, very similar, okay? But the UK have obviously had a bit more development okay um so a number of things um very easy uh in our discussions of mental health to just simply go 
well, let's just throw money at us. You know, it's like saying everyone gets a puppy. You know, no one's going to disagree with you. You know, everyone wants that. You know, everyone wants more money for mental health. But it's where the money goes as well. That's a very important point. You know, I mean, we could look at, for example, a number of reviews taken with counseling, uh, with like different counseling charities in the past where money is gone in terms of admin versus, you know, experienced staff members or even people being let go and cheaper people being brought in. Like, What's the value that's being looked at there? Uh, but for me, I think one of the big pressing kind of like, you know, questions, okay, because I know a lot of people out there are looking for access to services, affordability, you know, and I'm going to talk a bit about that because I know at different levels, people can only afford so much, okay? And I also want to offer some insight into what people can do as well, specifically, you know, with the system as present, the big question is, why are there so many private counsellors? Okay. So imagine if all the teachers went private, every single one of them. Okay. How more expensive would education be? When I talked to a number of my colleagues, mm. the question was raised, why does the HSC not employ so many counsellors? Uh, why is it that when you're actually applying for a job as a counsellor, that we fall under the same principle as many jobs do in Ireland? that you need to have umpteen to the years of experience and nearly ha- you need to have written the book on you know psychology itself back with Freud, you know? Uh, but we do have that culture in Ireland <laughs> that we actually, you know, we look for such high standards, okay? This is the advantage of a saturated market that we can demand standards. But I would always caution someone. I've seen reports where people would go, oh, to practice counseling, you need to have a master's level or a doctorate. That's okay if you're going to be a researcher in counseling. Okay. Fantastic. You can do long case studies. You can do like, you know, advance the field of knowledge is brilliant, but that doesn't necessarily mean to say you're a good counselor. You're book smart, but do you have it in the field though? I would always say the value in the education and training comes from field work and supervision. Okay. And one big thing that I want to touch on as well, and also to destigmatize this a little bit as well, uh, is accreditation. In the UK, most places will hire a counselor that have done about 270 hours into their accreditation status. Uh, you have to do about 450 hours to point with most professional accrediting bodies, both here and in the UK. Um, I say here as if I'm in Dublin at the moment, sorry. Uh, but most places will do in spirit two, you are Paul. In spirit I am. Most places will take you in the UK for 270 hours, okay? And you know, that's wonderful because you're seen as working towards that and you're answerable to an ethics framework and to a counseling body. You have your own insurance, you're able to practice, you're out of college. In Ireland, to get a look in, okay, you have to be accredited. That means 450 hours. And a lot of those hours are spent working either for free or very low cost. And counseling is an expensive profession to actually train in. Okay. On top of a course fee, you're looking at an additional, you know, two, maybe four grand a year, depending on extra training in terms of supervision and personal therapy. Okay. So it's a very expensive course. You'd want to be coming from either a very supportive family or have a lot of savings or a good job behind you as well uh, in a different field. So, We're looking at kind of like, you know, high standards there for employment, but there's a lot of able counselors out there who are not being employed and are having to turn to self-employment and try to build a name for themselves. As well as that, you know, I would always say to someone, 450 hours is a bit of an arbitrary number as well. Okay. Set by individuals who are in a self-regulated system. Okay. So like, you know, we can't possibly question what I'm going to question uh, because you could easily say 550 or 350. You know, why not? Why 450? Um, The thing is, though, there are counsellors out there who are able to deliver really good standards of work, who are determined and passionate, who will give everything. Uh, But they're simply not getting a chance because the bar is set really high. And that means that the public are denied access. And, you know, for the public as well, it can be very intimidating. The HSC have long waiting lists. So why aren't we hiring more mental health professionals? Uh, we've got, you know, assisted payment schemes, medical card schemes for doctors. Where's that for mental health? You know, I mean, like the thing is, at the end of the day, everyone has to be paid to do the job. And it's a very demanding job as well. 
because it does require a lot of support. And there's a lot of people out there ready and able to assist people. Uh, but one point I'll make, for example, and this is kind of like the hard truth, I was turned down for a position, uh, like moving from the university to like a paid position. I was turned down uh, because I wasn't accredited. Right now, I'm working on a panel of counselors uh, for like a bunch of insurance providers over in the UK. I'm still pre-accredited. Like I'm applying for accreditation with the BACP right now, but I just, you know, it's one of those things where it's just like, you know, so much on, long process over here, Mm -hmm. but I'm perfectly able to do my job and I'm respected by my colleagues as well, but I'm taking 40 plus clients a week. That could have been 40 plus Irish clients. That's the hard truth of it. Mm. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's yeah, that's kind of the grim of us, you know. Just to highlight that, anyways. That's heavy. It is a heavy tear when you say that. That could be forty Irish crowns a week. For I, unfortunately, I know the waiting lists are quite long, and for someone who may be on a waiting list currently back in Ireland, or someone who knows someone who's waiting on a on a waiting list, is there any like words of encouragement you would give or? Because I, I want this to be a bit of a transition as well to your work, which is predominantly yeah. online. Yeah. Um, but yeah, would there be anything that you could say to someone who's on a waiting list or knows someone who's struggling, but they're on a waiting list and they just feel a bit powerless? Yeah, absolutely. Um, when I was thinking on this, uh, I thought back to my family as well. We're very proud of my family. So not all of us will accept financial assistance from each other. So that means, you know, for one or two of us who've got a lot of kids, you know, they are on waiting lists for support. And it, when it comes down to it for a lot of us, the system won't change overnight. So we have to look at what is actually there. And I know at the moment, you know, in the most recent news, the likes of Hesed House closing in Inchicore, like calls for more clinics opening again, like, you know, and supporting those clinics. Absolutely. And I'm really happy that people are calling out for that because there's a lot of people out there and charities doing great work. And so essential as well. I know a couple of people going through those services too. But for the most part, I would encourage people to actually reach out privately to different counselors. And I'm going to talk about this for a moment because I know when you go online to like the likes of registries in terms of the IACP or NAPCP, IHIP as well, you'll get a directory of counselors who all have various prices and all that. But I'm going to tell you right now, a lot of counselors like myself would be open to the idea of low-cost counselling. Uh, pardon me for one moment. There we go. Uh, a lot of counsellors are open to the idea of low-cost counselling, okay, because, you know, we're not incompassionate like, you know, or incapable of that. Like, we will listen. Now, some people only have a certain, like, you know, threshold for how many low-cost counselling they can take. But even just picking up the phone and talking to someone, okay, talking is free like on the phone anyways, okay, just to make that point. It doesn't hurt to pick up and just ask because they might know someone who has capacity for low-cost counselling or they might meet you halfway and they might tailor it to you as well because I know a lot of people have pressures in terms of work and stress and all that kind of stuff in life that they might not have the availability to go somewhere or sit for an hour. So even just picking up and talking to a counsellor and seeing what they can offer and how they can tailor the support to you can be very beneficial. It's, it gives you at least an insight into your options and it's a step forward. Uh, as well as that, you know, you can also look at the likes of kind of like, um, you know, especially if you're waiting on kind of like that long kind of like waiting list as well. You know, some counselors will actually sit with you and do a free consultation as well. I know some of my colleagues do it. I do it as well. The free consultation you know, means that you can go and actually have a conversation and actually see if you're comfortable. Because there's a lot of stigma around being there present in front of someone who is trained to pick up on, you know, different behaviors, different kind of like patterns going on, and they're going to want to talk about it. So actually going to some counselors and having that freedom to actually sit there, see if you like working with them and see if you want to come back, it gives you a lot of power and a lot of control because it should be an equal relationship, ideally. You know, a lot like there's a lot of debate over that as well. Like, you know, because it, it, you know, realistically, it can't be equal because one has got knowledge, your one, you know, is the authority on themselves. But at least, you know, you can engage and see, you know, take affirmative action, take steps, get advice, 
a lot of counselors too will signpost to other services that they might know that you mightn't have been able to find online. Or they might know a way of you know accessing counseling sooner and through other the different contacts. You never know what you'll find until you actually pick up the phone and talk to someone though. That is the one thing I will say. So don't be intimidated mm. by a price beside someone's name. Just ask. You know, explain the situation, explain what's going on. The other thing I will say though, because I see this, you know, I see it in those who actually do fight to actually afford counseling, whether it's low cost or not. They 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 are determined to do work for themselves. It's a big commitment. You know, it's not like going to the doctor's office and getting something that'll fix you in a heartbeat. It's a big commitment, and that means you've got to set aside resources for it. And that means emotional and physical resources, because it's a big ask as well on the counselor too. So, you know, it really comes down to as well, and this is what has to be explored, you know, that commitment to therapy as well. Are you going to attend? One thing that is definitely found though in research the moment someone is paying for it, like themselves, they value it more. They're fighting for every single second. And I can see that as well in my own practice as well. I can I can see those, you know, the difference between someone who literally fought to pay, you know, the affordable rates that I have, they will fight for every single minute. You know, those who have it more comfortable perhaps or those who are having free access to services mightn't have, you know, because they mightn't value it because it's not their money. So there is also that kind of like, you know, dichotomy mm-hmm. there too okay mm-hmm. but i would say my general advice would be to pick up the phone and talk to a private one and see what you can find out thanks paul a question just popped into my head here and sure i think maybe some listeners would appreciate it where i have i have a friend who half jokingly half seriously says hey i'll go to therapy if they fix me if they can guarantee that they'll fix me and like at least my understanding of the whole process is that they can't fix you. They're just kind of trying to facilitate a process where you can kind of fix yourself. Um, I was wondering, could you unpack that a little bit? Because it, there's so many nuances in this argument, but it it is uh, like it it reminded me when you're speaking about the commitment to therapy. Like the commitment to therapy is not necessarily just a commitment to go to the session. You know, the commitment to therapy is to use those insights from those sessions on a day to day. Okay. Yeah. Um, I'll use an example here. Um, right. And this isn't just for uh, clients as a, as a point. This is also for therapists out there practicing. Okay. Imagine it like a bridge and two people on either side and they have to meet somewhere in the middle. Okay. Therapist has to be in that middle already, ready to work. Okay. This is how I practice. I'm there. I'm ready. It depends on whether or not they're going to step up and meet me there. If I need to step a little bit closer to them, okay. But they have to be the ones constantly moving towards the middle, okay? If they're stepping back all the time, they're not, they're letting me do all the work, okay? It's not going to happen because it's only so much, you know, therapists aren't magicians. We can't draw blood from stone. Uh, so there has to be that willingness to be open, that willingness to put in that work. And, you know, the more you put in, the more empowered you actually kind of like get as well. Because you can look back at it, and like one of my favorite things to say to a lot of my clients is, "You did the work." And a lot of the time they say, "No, no." But if it wasn't for yourself, going, "No, no," I leave the room. I forget. I am not. This is not me. I'm not taking responsibility for your progress. You know, I'm just facilitating. That work could not have possibly been achieved without the determination of the client. Okay. I can definitely facilitate and I can use the same mm-hmm. approaches with a hundred people, but you'll know who's actually putting in the work and who isn't. Okay. Even if it's a point of like one of my favorite things as well from an old supervisor of mine, you know, if someone goes, I don't know, well ask, what do you know? Focus on that then, you know, even if it's saying that you're afraid or that, you know, you don't know. Okay. And that's where you go. Don't think you have to have anything profound or have an ability to articulate self, just anything. You know, mm-hmm. the person on the other side is going to be willing to work with you for the very nature that you showed up. Yeah. I mean, they're not leaving. They're not running out the door. Mm-hmm. They're ready to work too. So that's the idea of the relationship there anyways, that they're, you know, you're meeting each other halfway at least, or always striving to be halfway. And Paul, you mentioned maybe a lot of the clients say they might be afraid and I wanted mm-hmm. to say that as well because it's it's scary, isn't it? Because potentially 
this work that you'd like to do or this state that you'd like to reach, whether it's a peace of mind or a, a sort of healing that you you hope, it, it may require you to do kind of like drop parts of who you thought you were and to kind of work on certain areas that you didn't want to look at before. And yeah, I, I it, it's, it is scary, isn't it? It's a scary endeavor. It is very intimidating. I do remember my first time going to therapy. I was actually, uh, as a point, because we're talking also about stigma here, I was made to go to therapy as a kid. Um, for sexuality, actually. Um, yeah, not going to lie. Um, you know, part of it was anger. Part of it was my mom secretly asking the therapist to try and fix me. So first of all, you know, because that is a narrative that some people go through as well. So when you're sat in front of someone who, you know, is literally been, you know, paid for by your parents to quote unquote fix you, uh, you know, you're kind of like going, well, you know, how am I going to be treated here? You know, do how much do I want to mm-hmm. open up about? Like, you know, who is this person? You know, what on earth is going to happen? And I remember being told by them as well. I think they're still practicing somewhere, but you know, they told me that, you know, what, you know, had been said over the phone and they just said to me, let's just forget about that, shall we? And just talk about what's going on with you. You know, they just politely pushed it aside, you know, because they were having none of it. And they were like, no, this session's about you, not about whatever your mother's going through. The sign of good counselor is actually being able to kind of like just push aside, you know, any sort of prejudices or any kind of like, you know, background that you might have, any baggage and just be there for the client. Okay. It doesn't matter who's paying for the session, okay? You're there for the client. So just because someone pays for it also, they're not entitled to know or to have a say in how it goes. Uh, the session's all about you. And never feel like that you don't have any power or control. You're the one telling the therapist where you need to go as well, okay? And if a topic's mm-hmm. too much, okay, you take a step back, but you might return to it. But you let them know. Okay, because you're an equal in that relationship. You have to be, you know, very nature, you're the one Mm -hmm. showing up. Okay, even if you're forced to go, like a therapist should recognize that, you know, you have been forced to go and have that openness to allow you to be an equal person in that, you know, relationship. That would be like, you know, my take on it as well. It's a one, it's a subject that is a bit close to home, but, you know, I know how terrifying it is, you know, and I'm very much aware when someone's sitting in front of me, you know, have they been advised to go? Are they being coerced to go? Are they going of their own volition? Mm-hmm. You know, it doesn't really matter. I'm going to treat them all the same. That I'm ready to work and I'm going to mm. accept them and try and be open as best as I can. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that, Paul. I appreciate mm-hmm. that. Um, I, I'd like to talk about online sessions. Sure. Um, I know um, generally I think people agree that the the switch towards online meetings generally not even in the in the counseling and therapeutic world um is is ne- is necessary during the covid period but it is frustrating and a lot of people feel like they're not connecting with the people how they used to connect uh, and there's just body language and and real like eye contact because it's so hard to keep eye contact even with meetings cuz wait you're looking am I looking at the camera am I looking at myself or I'm looking at him or all these things but I'd love to, I think it would be great to hear your take on on being in a profession where a lot of the, I think the majority you told me of your sessions are online. And how was that switch? Was it difficult? And do you have some clients that are initially hesitant because they don't feel like they can achieve so much with the online um, kind of distance between you? I'd love to hear about this. Sure, absolutely. Uh, first of all, you know, whoever in the IT departments everywhere decided, or you know, it, providers decided that you know we should have a small window that shows ourselves somewhere on the screen. Yeah, <laughs> thank you for raising everyone's self awareness. Uh, <laughs> you know, very important point. Um, uh, I, I wish re- the camera was like a tenth of the size it is. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It doesn't matter where you try and, and bounce this, you know. Uh, like <laughs> another thing as well, like you know, it's it like no, I'll get I'll get to that point in a moment. Um, right. so the move to online counseling, uh, it was something that I was comfortable. We were taught it in ICAS uh, well before COVID was coming in. Um, 
you know, we had someone who was taking clients across different areas of Europe. So when COVID happened, I was still working in TU Dublin at the time. Uh, I already had my own private practice at that point. My partner was brilliant in tech for technology. Uh, so they had a GDPR policy set up, you know, like different places to go, like good security as well. So general advice, firstly, for therapists out there and also for client knowledge. Uh, good security is essential. It is, you know, none of this free antivirus stuff, you know, get yourself a proper setup ticket to take this seriously because it is serious information. Um, generally speaking, I found like, you know, some some services better than others. Um, Skype over Zoom. Uh, I do jokingly say that after COVID, we will probably be adding a new diagnosis to the PTSD line, which will probably be Zoom related or Teams related. Mm. A lot of survivors of those systems as well. <laughs> you know. Yeah, well, no, to be fair, no, like, you know, I, I say it jokingly, but as well as I am aware, a lot of, you know, pressure on people to have to be present online and that's exhausting. Okay. So I'd say it jokingly, but I actually do, mm -hmm. actually, it does underpin a seriousness there. Um, so the move to online, uh, I would say firstly, uh, I'm a Gestalt practitioner. Uh, I'm going to talk about Gestalt later on, but you know, the main focus of Gestalt is also kind of like focusing on body language, all that kind of stuff. And I've seen some videos and some rebukes of online counseling, uh, both here and, uh, here in the UK and in Ireland. Uh, and so I'm going to come out flatly and say a couple of things. All right. Uh, there is no challenge. I'm going to like, you know, be flat about that right now. Okay. If there is like, because we were just talking about engagement there. Okay. And two people meeting in the middle. Okay. So if there's a reluctance mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. meet, you know, if that bridge is now virtual. Okay. And there's a reluctance. So it's going very easy to point to the bridge's fault. You know, it's going, oh, it's the bridge's fault that we're not connecting. No, no, too easy. Uh, therapist has to always be willing to connect with a client. Okay. So firstly, if the therapist is concerned that their body language isn't coming across, you know, waving hands in front of a screen or how you're sitting and all that kind of stuff, you are taught all that kind of stuff. Yeah. If that's what you're concerned about, okay, go back to supervision and say that because, you know, you can't be concerned about who you are or how you are in the session. You have to be focused on the client in front of you. Okay. And that client's mm -hmm. going to probably be meeting mm -hmm. you in their home. Okay. They're probably going to have kids screaming in the background. They're probably going to have a dog jumping up. Dogs are brilliant as a point in, the, in online sessions. I always encourage it. Uh, some of my clients as well, they have blankets, they have tea, all that kind of stuff on hand, which is brilliant. But, you know, we have to understand now that this is not a formal setting. Uh, even as another point as well, like, you know, formality about it is that you can actually be very casual with people. That's how you build a relationship. You know, yes, people come with serious issues, but they're like, you know, it needs to have that kind of like, you know, understanding that they're being met with someone who wants to talk to them and listen to them too. Mm -hmm. um, so the move to online was very natural for me. Uh, so I had a client recently who joked uh, when we started a session, they had said to me, it looks like, Paul, you're about to, you're set up uh, for playing PlayStation or something. Uh, yeah, uh, I said right back to them, who has the best headsets, <laughs> you know, sound counseling, uh, microphone, you know, decent, you know, ear, uh, earphones as well. Gamers do, of course, you know, so even though I'm I have a gamer myself, <laughs> uh, so it made sense. A decent webcam, of course, you know, the basics, you know, uh -huh. getting the system sorted, even allowing for an extra five, 10 minutes before the first session, to get technology sorted because obviously Skype's not going to open on the first try. There's always going to be an update or Zoom might can go through, okay? Yeah. <laughs> Whatever the system that you're using. Uh -huh. um, Psychology Today, for example, one of the main providers for online, like, you know, for advertising for counselors also have their own streaming service for sessions too. So it was good to see that. Oh. Um, yeah, but the move was very natural and very, like a lot of clients very respondent to it, very open. Uh, all the students over the summertime uh, just adapted to it immediately. Uh, I was still taking students over the summertime through COVID uh, because I had the willingness and the ability to do so. Whereas a lot of people were kind of like left behind trying to figure out how are they going to move online and all that kind of stuff. You know, that took a while. It took scratching heads in terms of technology. It's actually very straightforward. Just get security, get GDPR, get your 
filing system sorted and then just get yourself in front of the camera and be present. You know, that's simple as, you know, there's no excuse. Mm -hmm. And I would always say as well to someone, it's okay to not like the technology. That's fine. There is absolutely a space for face-to-face counseling. I would always say that because obviously you can have people who have been abused online, which means there's an obvious trigger, you know, to, you know, actually using an online counseling service. So absolutely you can be present with someone in person that will always be face-to-face. But I would slam critics of the services of online counseling, you know, if it's simply because they're afraid of it or that they just don't like the idea of it, you know, that's not credible. You know, there is a lot of research out there now that says efficacy of online counseling is there, you know, and, you know, here's the thing, like Mm -hmm. we are changing constantly. So like with all change, we are intimidated by it, but it's not fair to just criticize something because we're afraid of it. You know, we're, Mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's cheaper to use. It's more accessible for people. It means people don't have to leave their safe environments at home and put themselves out into the world because you know what, the world's full of people who are going to ruin your day if potentially so when you're coming out of a session vulnerable you know how much better it is to actually just instead finish a session and go up to bed and recover or have a cup of tea afterwards you know so it's a great and accessible service it's also brilliant of course for those you know who can't access certain clinics it's accessibility for you know disabilities as well like it's it's just marvelous mm-hmm. it is you know so it's it's many merits easily outweigh its criticisms you know, and as a point right now, you know, we're sitting here comfortably talking. I don't have to have my feet waving in the air to, you know, actually also have a good conversation. <laughs> I'm still coming across expressing, you know, perfectly fine at a comfortable distance, you know, as well. And totally looking the odd time over at my image, you know, but that's always going to be a case, you know, <laughs> but I would be definitely saying that, you know, it's on the therapist, you know, they have to be there present, you know, and for the client, it's, you know, an also kind of like, you know, them being comfortable with that, get used to it, have a laugh over technology fo- problems as well, you know, because it's not going to be perfect the first time, kind of breaks things down as well, mm-hmm. you know, and like, it doesn't matter how you're going to look on the other end of it, you know, you're both there to do one thing and that's to work towards the client's betterment. You know, that always has to be first. Yeah, just that one reminder, it can kind of supersede any maybe superficial uh, worry or anxiety or like we're here i'm here to help this person so yeah. i need to focus on this person <laughs> yeah absolutely <laughs> yeah i don't like i don't have time to be kind of going am i sitting okay you know it's just oh god my hair is a mess or something like that who cares you know like you know like you know how i look is not going to affect how i am as a therapist i don't have a magic outfit or a magic way of looking that day you know <laughs> So, and the camera and depending on the light is going to sometimes make me look completely shiny with sweat and all that kind of stuff. Or, (laughs) you know, it's going to have me like sitting, I used to say my phantom of the opera phase where as the sun moved during the day, I would have light on one side of my face and like, you know, shadow on the other side. I was going, (laughs) okay. (laughs) So there's definitely been all of that, (laughs) you know, even just the case of of the awkward ducking down to get the charger plugged in, all that kind of stuff, you know. Uh, about uh, yeah. as, yeah, about yeah, as yeah, graceful yeah. as a brick you know so <laughs> yeah <laughs> but you just have to laugh at those moments you know because this is totally. how the client is seeing us you know it's just uncomfortable because we're seeing ourselves yeah. yeah yeah Pot, you mentioned to me when we spoke a few weeks ago about the with the with the facilitation of online sessions i think you told me that there's now an increase in the number of 30 minute sessions um, it'd be cool if you could talk about this because I think mostly in people's minds, they think, oh, it's an hour. An hour is an awfully long time, isn't it? And I don't what would I even talk about for an hour? And I'll leave. But you mentioned how some people are checking in for 30 minutes and they're still getting a lot from them. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I know this is a bit of a, a hot point with some therapists as well. Like some agree with it and some don't, okay? Majority of my services are, are half hour, Okay. Uh, they're coming to me through EAP work, okay? And EAP work is very valuable. That's employment assistant programs. Uh, so in 30 minutes, okay, you have like, and this is like, I'm going to explain a few things here, actually. In 30 minutes, you can immediately establish what's going on with the client, okay? You can, you know, find out what's going like, you know, just look at kind of like what their needs are, construct a care plan, explore recovery techniques, you know, 
It's asking a lot of questions. You treat the first session as a fact find, okay? This idea, like, you know, when starting off that we have to be doing positive contracting or establishing, like, you know, kind of like, you know, that important relationship, you can accomplish that in one minute in terms of the relationship in a 30-minute session because you're letting the client know you're here to work, okay? Or do it in the initial mm-hmm. session, like, you know, the initial consultation. In terms of contracting, we have email. Send them the contract by email. Let them go over it in their own time. If they have any questions, respond to an email, okay? Don't use the session for questions on contracting, you know, or pick up the phone, okay? It's a piece of information. I'm not here to talk about, like, you know, documents, okay? You know, it's it, it, that's fine to do, but the therapy session should be therapy, okay? So in 30 minutes, you know, typically with, some, like with a lot of my clients, okay, this would be kind of like the six to eight sessions kind of clients, okay? Because that's what they get with the service. For a session, we get our care plan. We get a couple of different reflective techniques in place. We identify what's going on with the client or at least start to move towards us. You know, if they're having any sort of anxiety or panic attacks, we talk about recovery techniques, okay? We look at additional things that are going on for them in their life. We kind of like build a bit of a map together. And as well as that, we might look at like, you know, any sort of medication that they're on as well, just kind of like getting a general idea. In 30 minutes, that can all be accomplished, okay? It might be a bit intense, okay? But if the client is open to 30 minutes and you're open to 30 minutes, you can both accomplish a lot. With my private clients as well, outside of the EAP work, I give them the option. If they want 30 minutes, they can have 30 minutes. It's very accessible. It costs a bit less. And it's a half hour rather than a full hour, which means they still get plenty of time to do whatever. But if they want the full hour, they have the option when booking in. They can just say to me, I'd like an hour that time, Paul. And they go, all right, brilliant. Or you might recommend for more immediate kind of like interventions or more serious interventions that you might need the hour for that session. And that's perfectly fine too. Okay. You talk about it together though. You know, they're the ones paying for it. They're the equal in this. So you have to step up and go, right, what do you want? Offer an opinion, but be open to their opinion too. Okay. The idea that you've got to sit there and accomplish that in an hour, well, you know, there. I looking back on some of the sessions that I've sat in before as a client, even though I loved, you know, my personal therapist, you know, there were definitely, you know, moments where I kind of said to myself, I wish I could just finish here and just go and get a coffee because I feel like I've made enough progress today. Mm-hmm. You know, but because I've paid for the full mm-hmm. hour, I feel like I'm obliged mm-hmm. to stay. And there is definitely yeah, that concern yeah, as yeah. well, uh, like a concern as well that, you know, depending on what time it is in the session, well, you know, you can cause more harm by picking at something or digging at something that the client may not be ready to go into. But, you know, you feel like, you know, you need to kind of like continuously move progress as well. So that 30 minutes allows for a lot of control and it's an easier way to chart client progress. Uh, the way I work, I sell a lot of reflective exercises. So I'd say to the client, you do your reflective work that means you're doing the work outside of therapy. When you arrive and the 30 minutes, you set the direction where we're going. You tell me what exactly has come up and where we're going. And then that's what we do. Okay. Client autonomy. The client's not sitting there waiting for me to drag them in a direction. They're leading the session, you know, so it's a very efficient way of practicing and also gives a lot of power back to the client that they've got control over how long their session's going as well. Thanks for that, Paul. Yeah, mm-hmm. some really great points. It, it even hit on something that we touched on on a podcast or two previous where we were going over the the significance of people feeling like they have some agency and some some agency for their mental health. So whether that be with work or whether that be in the family dynamic, whether the, just to feel like the people are, are actually open to hearing your opinion and like your wants and desires are at least considered. Maybe they're not all provided but at least they're considered and yeah. to me it makes so much sense i mean of course there will always be differing opinions and maybe a lot of people would prefer the hour but i'm sure this shift that the online sessions are are contributing towards will will help a lot of people w- with this 30 minute session and, and just to build build up on this you also mentioned to me before which i thought was very interesting and i hadn't really heard of it before that people people are having kind of check-in sessions with you not necessarily oh i want you to be my counselor and i'm going to do it for 
three, four, six months, whatever. Just just one session. They just want to check in with you. They want to go over some things. And you are providing this space where you can kind of be a somewhat objective um, objective lens for them or more objective lens for them mm. to see oh, where they're at in their life and whether they think this thing in the future might be a big issue or with, where are they with their relationships. And then, yeah, I, I'd love if you could talk a bit about yeah, this. Yeah, sure. Uh, so I... I refer to this as the, well, depending on what side of the water you're on, the NCT of the mind or the MOT of the mind, getting a check over as you would send your car in for a checkup or go to the doctor for a checkup. Okay. It's no different. It, I get a few people who come to me who are concerned that they might be developing anxiety or depression and they just want to talk about it or get more informed. And they may only just need a bit of advice for that one session or just a couple of signposting to different techniques just so they can manage it. They're getting a handle on it before it becomes a big problem. You know, that's the idea. And they value it because they just want to have a check over. You know, it's not that they're afraid to do it. They're just coming in and kind of going, I'm availing of this service because I feel like I just need a quick once over of the mind. And it's very informative. I mean, we like, mm. you know, depending, you know, of course, we go to our doctor and we get a full check over, like, you know, blood, all that kind of stuff you know checking in because you know we can't foresee every single problem and mental health problems are that silence kind of like you know thing as much as we can't see under our skin we can't see into here you know so oh pardon mm-hmm. me mm-hmm. um so it's really good and it's also really exciting as well because like i love seeing that with someone as well kind of going right they're taking responsibility here they don't need 10 or 12 sessions they just might need one where they can just go okay and they have a look at it and they might get something from that session that, you know, gives them the tools that they need to get on by. It, it just might catch it, you know, a problem before it develops into something that requires 10 or 12 sessions or even more. So yeah, I would always encourage someone even just getting a once over to check, even for the sake of just getting it vocalized. You know, if you feel like you need to get like a bit of advice or a third perspective or you know, another perspective, by all means, you know, just check in with a counselor and see, like, you know, what they would say, you know, if they would recommend continuous sessions or if they are fine with it, like, you know, like, you know, carrying on as you are. And that point's particularly important, uh, which will, like, you know, we'll probably touch upon in a moment. Um, I just wanted to make a small point before you go on to, I guess you wanted to talk about the Gestalt. And yeah. yeah, just before that, I wanted to say how it's nice to hear um, it's nice to hear you're saying this, that you encourage one sessions, because I think there might be a thing in the air that, oh no, like I want, if you're, if you're taking my time, I want at least this amount of, you know, months, you know, almost like a quite cynical, I don't you know, almost like financially driven, like looking at clients, like how much, like, is it worth their time? That kind of stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Like, um, there is definitely like a mindset that I think does come across in the industry sometimes, uh, that, you know, we're looking at a business, you know, perspective, you know, turnover with clients, all that kind of stuff. Like, I mean, that's one perspective to have, you know, like, you know, that's on every individual, their own onus. But at the same time though, like, you know, we have to look as well, at just how many people are out there. Okay. Like, you know, mental health, if we're talking about it as an industry, you know, God almighty, you know, we've kind of, you know, we have a serious problem, you know, like, and, you know, we just need like, you know, turnover clients, make sure everyone's getting on okay. That is the objective, okay? You know, whether or not we're getting on fine, okay? And how we determine that, that comes down to self, mm-hmm. okay? Mm-hmm. So I know myself, like, you know, I I know where I'm comfortable with in terms of, you know, allowance, all that kind of stuff, like my, my allowance for extra clients, all that kind of stuff, uh, like where I'm at comfortably, like I'm not looking to like, you know, have a lavish life, something like that, you know, it's, it's a case in point say, oh no, just pay the bills and carry on, you know, because God, you know, we're all, you know, in a very difficult situation, you know, and that's how we should be looking at it. It's not about whether or not someone's going to be a long-term investment, you know, or whether or not they're going to be a regular income, okay, people will come anyways, you know, there's a lot of people out there who are waiting, you know, and we need to be accessible, affordable, and open, you know, totally. so, yeah. Totally. I couldn't agree more. It's lovely to hear. And um, it would be great if you could um, maybe talk us through your 
your chief approaches or your chief yeah. techniques to help people. Of uh, course. I believe that the pronunciation is gestalt. Some say gestalt. I say gestalt. But then again, okay. some people say I have a bit of an American accent at times. So, okay. you know, we'll, we'll go with however I like, you know, pronounce or however you would like to pronounce this, you know. In any <laughs> case, it doesn't change too much how it works. Um, so for any of my colleagues actually, um, you know, listening out there, um, because and actually a lot of people as well, uh, I work from an integrative approach using CBT and Gestalt therapy. They work brilliantly together, fantastic pairing, both very similar objectives. But anyone who would have studied with me going to college would know I hated CBT with a passion. Okay, because I always said handing out worksheets is about as useful as handing people the newspaper. Okay, I'm very cynical. Okay, when it comes to that. And I do often say that there are some techniques out there that are very dated. Okay. But better be the cynic to practice than the fool who practices thinking that it's wonderful. So, you know, I also come at it with a point of there's actually some useful stuff in CBT. It's not to be discredited because it actually has a lot of efficacy behind it. I'm aware, however, that it is standard approach in the medical systems, both here in the UK and in Ireland, and that a lot of people come out of it feeling that they've not had a good therapeutic experience. CBT works well when it's paired with another modality, and Gestalt is one of the best ones to do. So I'll focus on Gestalt because that one's the that one's the real meaty one, I suppose. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, so it's very objective driven. Uh, very much focus on being present. Okay. Too often we're focused on being in the past or the future. So Gestalt looks at kind of like a lot of affirmative kind of like statements referring to the present. You know, the I, thou, the I, like the idea that you're saying, I feel this way and I am this, instead of kind of going, well, he made me feel like that and, you know, all that kind of stuff. Like it's actually focusing on immediately how you're feeling and stating it. Uh, that's the basic principle behind, you know, kind of like, you know, the language that's used. Um, it does have a lot of kind of like, you know, different like cool facets to it. Uh, so for example, uh, I know, I definitely know a couple of, you know, former students who are clients um, who would have known me for role playing and the empty chair technique uh, because of how intimidating it can be, but also how, you know, intense it can be. So I'm going to talk about that. Um, Gestalt looks at kind of like getting us to face a lot of interjections that we have inside ourselves. So interjections are kind of like walls. Uh, they're just there that we can't see around. So we often try to look at ways of going around it instead or just ignoring it or just not like butting our heads against it and we don't understand why. Um, and we often then fall into a pitfall of looking at ourselves from other people's perspectives. Uh, they're called retro reflections. Uh, and we can be very critical of ourselves. And they both kind of like lead to kind of like that pop psychology uh, thing of projection that we literally project outwards what is going on and we project onto the next person or project onto you know anything around us. Uh, projection is better explained in Gestalt anyways. It's a point of kind of like a projection of our internalized frustrations. It's not something to be dismissed. It's actually coming from a long line of you know systemic problems that just need to be looked at kind of like a signpost that you just work your way back on. So the role-playing and empty chair technique, uh, I treat them kind of both in the same uh, because working online, I don't have the chair anymore to kind of like get someone to sit in front of and talk. Uh, so I use kind of like a box instead. Um, but there was, okay. definitely, there was definitely a few moments in sessions where as soon as I went over and reached for the chair, I would just hear a groan from the clients. They're going, oh, Paul, not this. And I go, yes, this. You know, I know it was intimidating last time, but we keep going because we're, we're going, smashing through this. And if we're, like, I would always say to someone, it's going, you can't fail at this because, you know, if there are frustrations, we look at them, you know. So if they're struggling to come to terms with the person that they – you know, project out onto the chair or like into the box, for example, that's still informing of pains that are going on and being present with that. It's done in a controlled way as well. So if the client, like, you know, there's the general, oh no, come on, like not this. Okay. But if there's general discomfort, like getting upset or just really strongly reacting to it, you just stop it and you make sure it's, you let the client know that there are safety procedures in place as well. Um, 
So I'll talk about the box because that's the best example that I use. I normally get a lot of clients to imagine the person causing conflict in their life. And this is specifically to do with any relationships, for example, uh, anyone who's impacted self-esteem. And I don't mean romantic relationships. I mean, friendships, family members, anything. Okay. It could be an employer or an employee. Uh, I'm putting them in that box. The box is something that they control. They control all the parameters of it, make it as big or as small as they want. They can speak and the person inside that box can hear them, but they can't hear anything that the person inside the box is saying unless they want to. Okay. It is an opportunity for them to have the conversation that they don't normally get to have without consequence. They can Mm -hmm. just vent, pour, give back, Mm -hmm. put into that space of the box, everything that belongs to the person who they've placed in there. Okay. Because one of the big things I see with a lot of people when it comes to hurt, emotional pain, it could be, and that's ranging from anywhere between like, you know, domestic abuse, physical abuse, emotional abuse, or sexual abuse, uh, is that, you know, we give a part of ourselves away trying to hold close a door where that person, that abuser is actually on the other side. That means like a part of us is always occupied. So we're also giving back, you know, to them all the abuse or all the pain or any sort of like, you know, incongruence that they brought to us as a client and we're taking back control. That's the objective. The client takes back control. They have like, you know, they can, as much as they can make the box bigger or smaller, they can change the shape of it. They can shake it if they want, fill it with water. I've seen all sorts of things. Someone set it on fire once before. It was going, wow, okay. Uh, well, no judgment, you know. It's, uh, no but, judgment. Yeah, uh, but still. Um, but the idea is that they just take back their control. And for a lot of people out there at the moment, especially feeling trapped or like in situations where they may not feel that they have any control because of, you know, different people in their life, you know, it's important for them to actually be able to take that back and actually realize they're not trapped, that they have a lot of themselves to give and offer. It's just a lot of it has been taken up by people who don't deserve their attention or who have taken like from them a lot of kind of like their energy as well. So the main focus is, you know, like, you know, getting that control back. Um, Other aspects of it that are very useful, and this is where EMCS obviously came into it as well. Um, I, you know, I say this is like, it's always a bit pop psychology from this. I do practice dream therapy as well, uh, which is a facet of Gestalt. Uh, Exploration of the subconscious uh, or the unconscious mind uh, dreams. Um, Because our mind is building narratives. It's processing, you know, hundreds of thousands of images Okay. And for people who have nightmares, I always get them to keep a note of them, to journal them down because they are informative of fears that are going on. Um, examples given uh, for like, you know, someone who might have been stabbed in the back might, I might have been a victim of sexual abuse or attempted sexual abuse because, you know, the idea of the knife penetrating, the idea of someone invading someone's personal space. Okay, a very good link between the two of them. It's looking at narrative here. Okay, the reason I say EMCS is wonderful because you know, for the love of God, for about four years we studied you know signs and you know signs signifier and signified. You know that was drilled into us. So we're looking at the kind of like the significance of meaning behind these dreams. Okay, the client as well as you're placing them out there as suggestions can pick you know, what actually suits what doesn't and openly explore then, okay? Because it's them coming to terms with their nightmares too. It can just be a nice doorway into suppressed emotions or trauma as well. And, you know, it's not that, you know, anything comes about of it, like, you know, as in like, you know, we we correct someone's dreams and all that. It's literally just used as a fact finder. We go, right, that's where the pain is. And look at how, look at looking at how it's linked Mm. to other areas of their life. You know, it's just that untapped narrative, you know, that's going on, you know, and it's also nice because, you know, it kind of like factors into like a lot of the work that I would get a client to do outside a session. Um, Just a moment. Oh, the joys of a warm day. Um, One of the things I get a lot of people to do, um, you know, anyone who's gone through the CBT systems, uh, cognitive behavioral therapy systems, would know journaling is definitely a prescription 
uh, for most counselors to do, writing things down, all that kind of stuff, okay? Um, maybe it was ruined for me from the amount of writing down that I had to do, trying to keep up with Grania's notes, perhaps. But, uh, <laughs> you know, Grania, a former lecturer of ours, is totally probably giving me stares now for listening to that. Uh, but <laughs> I, always, I, I, I always found writing to be a bit of a lackluster kind of attempt or approach. Some people find it useful, though. Okay, I'm going to say that. I just didn't. So I get a lot of my clients to actually record themselves by audio. Uh, the idea being, okay, is that they're being present. There's only them. So they record what's going on with their mind. They talk about stuff that's circling on up here. They have a rant, okay? The beauty of this is, and this is what I explained to them, it's like they're sitting in front of a friend and they would listen to that friend as much as they could and try to be a, like, you know, they're present, okay? It's them having a bit of control because they hit player stop. They're being present with themselves. There is only them in the present tense. In that moment as well, it's not so much the words that they're saying, it's how they're saying them. Tone of voice. Are they sad? Are they upset? Is there frustration? Okay. Is there any sort of distress? And if there is, why? They can immediately access and they can't lie to themselves. They'll know immediately if they're being disingenuous. You know, if they're trying to put on an act, they'll know it. You know, and the beauty of it as well is, is at the moment they know it, they've just found their interjection, the wall, you know, and it's that point that they go, right, who does it belong to? How can I rationalize this out? And what I would always say to someone as well is if it's something that they can't rationalize it out, they note it down and go, right, I'm taking it to Paul next session, or I'm taking it to my therapist and go, this is what came up and this is what needs to be looked at. So it's a good technique as well because it means, you know, it's a lot of kind of like reclaiming identity, a lot of mirror work, kind of like with the reflective stuff with the noise, the sound, you know, and that's also a beauty thing as well that a lot of us forget uh, when we look at kind of like authenticity, uh, that reflective kind of like, you know, what does it mean? Uh, it also is less tedious and kinder on the hand, I suppose, than writing things down because, you know, I've, I just found journaling, we spend too much time thinking about how the word is or spelling the word or like our focus on that. It's a learned behavior. Um, although mm. that being said, to, to counterpoint that, you know, there are some people who do find it, find it like journaling incredibly useful and that they do find this in themselves very intimidating. And if that's the case, that's perfectly fine too. Okay. It's coming to terms with that comfort or discomfort. Okay. That needs to be looked at too. So like I always say to clients as well, there's no way you can fail that task because any result is a result. So that would always be my mindset mm. there. But generally speaking in terms of the efficacy of it, like I found like without going into too much detail, I found Gestalt therapy as a modality. Its biggest success was for those who actually had encountered sexual abuse because it allowed them to also reclaim their emotional and physical state as well. They got to confront their attackers who, for many of them, they didn't recognize who their attackers were. So mm. it was a very important step for them to actually have a space where they can take back some autonomy. You know, and that's it as well. Yeah. It's not looking at someone in terms of a broken you know, individual. It's someone who's just been disconnected from their autonomy and just needs to get back to it. You know, and that they have every power in them to do so. I love that, Paul. That's very uplifting and empowering to hear that. And, you know, even I think you helped me personally just put a few things together here where I'm partial to a long voice note on, on WhatsApp. Mm -hmm. And when I send a long, juicy, thoughtful WhatsApp message, it, I do reach a place that I don't reach so often, do you know? Um, initially, like, I wouldn't like to sound in my own voice and with the help of this podcast and other things, I got better at that. But even when I would send long voice messages to like a few people that I think would really like hear what I'm saying, I am required to, to, to really be honest, you know, really be honest with myself. And, and like you said, I think there's a lot to be told or a lot to be said for the tone. Like you said, you know, we don't need to explain how tone gets misconstrued over text and email and stuff. Mm -hmm. But you, you know, if you listen back to a voice message, you really feel how, how that made you f feel, you know, you can, you go, wow, my, my voice changed there. Or I really had to pause because 
I was really considering what word to use. So it was, it was a profound feeling for me. And, and did this all makes so much sense now that you're explaining this? That's definitely a thing that we look out for as well as a process. So I suppose the one thing I will say, uh, you know, because we don't see the full body in person online, you know, because a gestalt therapist would look for all indicators uh, if someone was nervously tapping their foot or fidgeting at something. But we look for the changes in the tone of voice and the changes in body language. And we look mm-hmm. at kind of like eye movement, all that kind of stuff. So it's the small things and even getting the client to notice them about themselves is so empowering and so informative for them. You know, it can just be that nice moment where they actually step back as also a point just to bring it up just for a a more of a lighter side of it as well, because, you know, uh, I've had a couple of clients who are expressive in different uh, medium or media, Uh, like my own partner, for example, would sing. Uh, I've had a couple of clients who actually sing their recording instead, so they'll actually like just belt it out like by voice and all that kind of stuff. Cool. Um, yeah, like looking at alternatives to therapy is actually a really good idea. I'm always in favor of different explorative works as well. So, you know, I even to say, you know, if you're on your own house, because you know all of us are singers are harsh, just how good we are. Well, that's for ourselves, actually. I know I can't carry a tune, but sometimes <laughs> just singing how you feel as well is also pretty like you know because it's just like kind of going you know saying i don't care how i sound you know like i'm just going to sing it you know that's not for everyone obviously but i do know a couple of people who just love that as well and that wasn't me directing it that was them Mm -hmm. telling me that they've done it instead so you know it was really nice as well very good learning experience for me and how other people take you know the tools i give them and how they rework them so it's always great to hear that too that's also a point Okay. That's also a, 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 sorry to cut across to you. My apologies. It's a very important mm-hmm. point. Never think that your therapist is the be all and end all of knowledge. We are not above learning something new. Okay, that is something that is so critical. Okay, that you know, we're equals, and we're, that means if we don't know something, we'll either go off and find out about it, but we are open all the time to learning something new, or we should be. You know, so. Yeah, mm. I'm never afraid to say that I've learned something from a client. You know, that's even just just on a side point, that's beautiful to hear from you, Paul, because I was only saying to my sister yesterday about how I don't feel 100% safe with someone if they are 100% or no, if they don't have the slightest doubt about their strongest conviction, mm. which may sound strange. Like, it, I feel very safe around someone who is okay with admitting that the possibility that they might be wrong about something, even though they're pretty sure. And to hear you say this, I'm sure it would, it would calm yeah. a lot of people down because like you said, there is this on this. Sometimes there's a, an atmosphere maybe about, Oh, well, this person knows so much more than me and they're just right about this thing. And, but it would be lovely for people to hear to you to go on here. I'm also learning every day. I'm learning as well. Yeah, that's exactly it. Like whether it was saying to our old lecturers that their experiences have informed me or that, you know, a lot of my clients even starting out that, you know, their stories all kind of contribute to an ongoing narrative that helps me help new people. So their healing process is actually carried on into the healing of other people as well, which can give a lot of strength. But another fun thing that I love to say to people is whenever just doing work, I would always say to someone who might be reluctant to try, I would go, at least try it, if not for the ability to be able to turn around to me in the next session and say, Paul, what were you talking about? You know, you're an absolute, you don't know, you're, you know, gobshite, you know, so like at least to be able to say that, you know, I would actually respect them for saying that to me because then they at least have tried it. Yeah, Yeah, absolutely. Um, Mm -hmm. Paul, we're moving towards the end, right? But there's a few more things I'd just love to cover. Sure. One is the idea of authenticity you mentioned a few minutes ago. And I'm currently reading this book called uh, The Journey of Soul Initiation by Bill Plotkin. And he, in summary, from what I've read so far, he talks about the the importance of nature-based development. Okay. Um, I could go... I mean, we'd love to have Bill on the podcast in the future or whatever, but just this particular this particular section stuck out to me. And then I'd love to hear your thoughts on um, on Jung and his idea of individualiz- individualization. But the quote yeah, sure. is, the quote is, the nature-orientated task is the cultivation of authenticity. 
the capacity to know who you are psychologically and to express and embody this identity in your own social life with your friends, family, and coworkers. The culture oriented task is to obtain social acceptance from and belonging in at least one desired peer group. This doesn't sound so difficult, does it? Well, it is. This is, in fact, precisely where the majority of contemporary people get stuck in their personal development. Either their task is not so hard by itself, i.e. authenticity is a piece of cake and you don't mind alienating others and possibly being friendless, and social acceptance is a snap if you're okay with being an imposter, willing to act in whatever ways are necessary to be accepted. But succeeding simultaneously with the two tasks can be immensely challenging. This is due in part to how formidable it has become in the contemporary world to be authentic, to even know who you are, let alone to be able to embody the real you in your choices and relationships. Our own advertisement saturated and fear infused society with its emphasis on looking good, driving us to act within narrow prescribed bandwidths. Most people have lost the ability to identify their bedrock values, needs, desires, and limits or their genuine opinions, attitudes, and personal styles. When I read this, I had to reread it and I just thought, yeah, here we are. Like, here is the struggle. Like, we want to fit in, but we want to be ourselves. And we're not really getting developmental um, techniques to help us with this. In fact, there are a lot of, uh, you know, advertising companies and, and whatever that are actually benefiting from this kind of lost in the sauceness if you will yeah absolutely like i mean myself and yourself have the benefits of knowing what goes on behind in terms of kind of like that structuralist approach you know privation of history inoculations all that kind of stuff uh how advertisers work okay and as a point some advertisers actually uh I remember when I was doing my short course in counseling, I did, there was some of their training in advertisement. Uh, some people actually do take up the profession just to get the tools that they need to understand how people work just as a point to, you know, that's fine. That's their own educational experience, but it is maybe not ethical, but that's a different discussion, obviously. Uh, you know, who say what's ethical when it comes to advertisement, uh, but still. Uh, so, the main point there is authenticity and, you know, individuation. Okay. Uh, I always loved it myself. I loved the kind of like idea when I first read the quote on individuation, which was that struggle to be unique, but simultaneously belong that synthesis of opposites. Okay. I loved that idea of it because it summarized a struggle that we're constantly going through. Okay. How do we fit into this grand narrative? Like, you know, because it's very easy for us to feel lost or small or to look at other people who may seem larger than life and go, wow, why can't it be like that? You know, and to touch upon then what our traits are, what is authentic, especially considering we live in a society where we surrender so much of ourselves online. Everything we do has to be online. I'm off most social media, but I still have to have an online presence, for example. You know, it's very difficult to just be completely separate, you know, because a part of me has to exist. Um, when I talked about the audio journaling, that can be a really good technique as a point to reconnect with who you are. In that moment, there's only yourself, okay? And I'm going to just talk about, this is kind of like leading on to some work that I had done before and what I kind of like charmingly called the Black Mirror stage, you know, for all fans of the show, Black Mirror. Um, it's a, also a play on the mirror stage of the can. Okay, psychoanalysis right there. There's only one point in our lives where we 100% accept ourselves. Okay, and I would say this to every single client. And that's the moment when we look in the mirror and go, hey, that person waving back is me. That's that kind of like recognition kind of going, oh my God. Um, in that moment, we're too young to have been impacted about how we should and shouldn't be. Our parents haven't already instructed us on how we should and shouldn't be either. So we're not carrying with us the baggage of culture, politics, or that. We're just concerned with who we are. Most, if not every moment after that, then is a dilution of that. Uh, sorry, a dilution. I always mumble that, and some people actually think I say delusion, uh, but it's a dilution of that, okay? 
And for some of us, we reclaim that space a little bit. Okay, we might look at ourselves in the mirror and kind of go, actually, today is a good day. Other times we look at ourselves and we might recognize who we are because we're made up of different parts that belong to other people, or we're looking at ourselves kind of like that, you know, uh, optician's glasses where they put constant lenses through it. We're looking at ourselves through many different lenses that belong to other people, and we're seeing this distorted image of self. So it's very important to bring awareness to that and take all of those lenses back out because underneath all of them is actually who we are. I talked about this before in terms of mathematics, uh, aximetry, the idea of projection of true. Uh, the looking at kind of like when you look at something from a side, you don't see all its measurements completely. So you have to look at things from different perspectives and find informative points and project outwards a true self, okay? So when we look at ourselves in the mirror or when we listen back to ourselves, we're seeing two perspectives that we can just map out and actually find points that are actually true. Okay, that intersection between reflection or recodification and who we actually, you know, what's here, you know, that projection outwards, we can find a true point, you know, a true indicator of who we are. So, for example, with the audio journaling, the recording might sound distressed and it might make us feel distressed. And we might plot both points out and actually find, actually, hold on a second, we are distressed and this is why we are distressed and this belongs to us. Okay, so that would be the example I would give there. But that can also work with more positive attributes too, you know, perceptions of what beauty is, perceptions of what, you know, taste, fashion, anything that you want in terms of like, you know, that quantify enjoyment or who we are, like we can find that, you know, through that same process, but it has to belong to ourselves for it to be authentic, not for anyone else, okay? I would say this as well to anyone in different kind of cultures as well. There's no council anywhere where you have to justify your identity before. Okay. So, you know, we're only really answerable to ourselves, you know, and if anyone else wants to impact on that or tell you how you should and shouldn't be, well, you know, you have to kind of step back and kind of go, well, where are they coming from? You know, is it their job to do so? Is it really anyone's job to do so? You know, like, do they need to because they're afraid of what people might see in them? You know, what that might entail? This kind of, like, discussion underpins a lot of what we have at the moment in terms of cyberbullying or, you know, just even just more kind of, like, you know, low-key manipulation online that we're kind of coerced into consuming different products or being a certain way because that's what everyone else wants us to have or that's what is the preferred mode of being is. So it's very easy to be lost in all of that, okay? What really matters is us reconnecting with our reflection and kind of go, right, I own this and this is who I am and no one's going to take that. What comes to mind is a, a quote I read a few years ago, which was, uh, you, you really aren't, you really can't be striving to be somebody, but rather to just uncover yourself. That was, I love sentiments like that, but it's very difficult to reach that point. Because I know yeah. Jung talked about us reaching the state of nirvana and all that kind of stuff. But, you know, those are abstract thoughts that people, you know, will try and reach through different processes, you know, you know, whether it's self-reflective, whether it's mindfulness, all that kind of stuff. But really, it's all the work that we do in front of the mirror or listening back to ourselves. You know, that's the process, the path that we follow, actually listening or paying mm -hmm. attention to ourselves, not relative to anyone else, just being present with ourselves that singular moment where time doesn't have to matter it just has to be that moment present i love it paul I love it uh, thanks so much and to just to end it i think a lot of listeners including myself would benefit from you kind of just going over some some of the issues that you saw consistently among clients over the last year or so and i know myself i I love to, I don't love to hear, I feel reassured when some of my anxieties or some of my struggles are also being uh, <laughs> shared among other people. And that's not to say I love that other people are struggling, but it's just a camaraderie, it's a I sense, guess. Yeah, or, it's a sense of belonging. A sense is. of belonging, yeah. Yeah. Um, there was a good quote that I got from a client again, just, you know, there's a common thought that we're all inclined to say that we're on the same boat, which is a, an accurate statement. They're, they shared this to me. I think it was their uncle's wisdom. It was, but 
they said, rather than thinking like that, we're all in our own individual boats in the same storm. But we can't see what's going on in everyone else's boat. We can only really focus on what's going on in ours. Some people will call for help. Some won't. And some people might not recognize that you need help. And you might not even recognize it yourself. But you're all in the same kind of like storm. Some boats come together, some don't. Okay? But it's to make it actually, you know, that focus on the individual. Um, as a point before I go into, you know, what is kind of like, you know, more the common stuff that comes up. I would say to people as well, don't ever devalue your experience. You'd be surprised how many sessions open with people going to me. I'm sure you've heard a lot of, and I was going, don't presume that I'm judging you against every single person that I've seen beforehand. Um, This is where relativity comes in. And I love that word because in the session only myself and the client exists and I'm not the one, I'm just the facilitator. It means that for the client, we're the only two people on the rest of the, on the planet, whatever they're going through at that time, whatever their problem is, it is relatively important, as in its importance is relative to the client, making it the most important. Okay? It doesn't matter if someone's coming in with extreme PTSD or if someone's coming in with just a touch of anxiety over exams, it is the worst thing for them at that time, making it the most mm-hmm. important. Okay? So mm-hmm. both are the same. They have to be, you know, otherwise, like, how, like you just, what are we doing? Triaging, you know, until, yeah. you know, if someone becomes bad, you know, that's yeah, yeah, a real yeah. negative outlook to have. So some of the more common things that have been coming up, um, this is the big thing at the moment, of course, uh, coming across in the news, but, you know, in the UK and Ireland, uh, workplace attitudes, a lot of people adjusting to work online and working from home. A lot of people are devaluing themselves because of how they work. People will push themselves beyond their limits. They'll start their morning by turning on their work computer or answering an email before they get out of bed. And they might finish at 10 o'clock at night after starting work at like half eight in the morning because they just want to get a project done. I always equate this down to bricks. How many bricks you're willing to carry? Okay. So if you're going to work for a certain wage, certain amount of time, you're going to carry a number of bricks. Naturally, in any job, we take on more bricks, okay? Because when our employer asks, because we don't want to let them down, people leave the team. You know, we have to carry more bricks because the same amount of work still has to happen. The client's not going to wait for, you know, us to adjust or the workload's not going to wait until we adjust. So we've got to carry more. So we might take on an extra four bricks. And then even still, you know, we're told someone's coming in eventually to help or changes will be made or your input's valued, okay? I hate all that lingo as a point, you know? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I do genuinely believe that there are people out there who work in HR who, you know, go to their annual meeting in a volcano lair somewhere, how to use (laughs) language in a corporate setting. Um, (laughs) No, no, that's just me joking, of course, you know? But, um, But still, at the end of it, a lot of people can end up carrying twice as many bricks for the same amount of pay, okay? Same amount of time. That's the arbitrary thing here, but like realistically when you look at it that way someone has just half their salary because they're going special offer on my time two for one you know and because they've accepted it for so long they can't get out of it which means someone who might be earning thirty two thousand might now be earning what uh six no where's my maths today 16 yeah sixteen thousand. yeah you know good thing i did english not you know maths uh (laughs) but but you know when you look at it like that you know that's not a standard of living you know, and employers will happily take those free hours, you know, and when I map it out with clients, you know, they actually step back and kind of go, holy crap, I'm giving an extra day or two in the week in terms of the hours that when they add up, you know, and like, like, they're not mandated to do so, you know, they're not paid for those hours. I would always say to someone, if your workplace wants you to work more, they can pay you for that privilege, you know, they can pay for your time. Or they can actually value the work that has to go into it. Okay. So I would say to someone who's listening as well, just as a point, consider your work in terms of bricks and how many you're carrying. And actually, have you devalued where you're actually going? Have you accepted more and more? And are you doing more hours for free? Because if you are, every hour that you're doing for free is you basically saying you're worth less. You know, it's not good. You're not wait. Don't be waiting for someone else to tell you otherwise. Take a hard look at that right now and go, right. 
I apparently am worth less and I've allowed this because we're in a culture where we have to please our employer and our employer readily sits back and places the onus on us. Well, they chose to do that. Well, they could have accessed different programs to help them. You know, they could have, like, the onus will be placed right on you because the system's designed that way. Okay. So it's a bit of a wake up mm-hmm. call for that one. Okay. Mm-hmm. You're not alone in it either because, uh, like, hundreds of people have done it. Most of the clients I see in the EAP work would actually have that issue as well. Uh, and then when they're giving so much time, their relationships, their family fall apart or other things. They might have people who they care for who are unwell. Everything falls apart then, you know? So it has to be give and take. And employers need to wake up to the idea too that it costs a fortune to burn out your clients or your actual employees, you know, a month, two months, three months, you know, I mean, like, you know, how long do they want them off? You know, the work's still going to be waiting for them, you know, so it's important that they invest. Um, I suppose another thing that would be commonly coming up as well is that feeling of trapped, you know, that existentialist kind of like feeling of being trapped because a lot of us now have found that we're working just to keep the roof over our heads. We don't get to go out and enjoy ourselves. We see the resistance on the streets. You know, a lot of people are rebelling as they would. Like I would always say to someone, for many of us, we haven't experienced being told not to go outside since we were only like five or six being told not to go out and play in the rain. Okay. And we don't like being told what not to do. Okay. Now that's a different, Mm -hmm. you know, kind of like discussion there, but we can see the resistance certainly to that. Okay. But it's resisting against the feeling of being trapped because we're social creatures. Even those introverted of us needs social contact or that feeling that they can go somewhere. So, it is that idea that we're going to have to reconnect with people and get comfortable again with people as well. Because the other thing as well, building up, sorry, apologies, one second. No worries. Um, the other thing that's building up is a growing social anxiety. You know, is it safe to be around people? You know, like, is it going to be an unusual environment? You know, are we aware of other people around us? You know, heightened awareness. So, a lot of those issues are coming up too. And for that, it's just taking it slow, taking it safe, exposure slowly over time while taking good preventative measures for yourself. If, you know, don't feel obliged to end any protective measures that you might have had for yourself over lockdown, just because everyone else is relaxing. Okay. Do what's comfortable for you and take it slow. There's no one set pace mm-hmm. for it. Okay. Um, mm-hmm. As well as that, if there is that growing social anxiety, connect with people you know, it, like open up about it because a lot of people will be going through it too. And it can just be nice as well, a nice foundation for people to build on if they're anxious about meeting up with each other. Start from there, you know, nice base common denominator where you can actually just both have a laugh and be vulnerable, you know. And that's actually mm-hmm. the beautiful thing about most encounters as well. Every relationship can be drawn back to one point, to being kids in the schoolyard again. Kids are a wonderful example of this because kids just want to know and to accept and be accepted. So if we're anxious in any way, just think of what it's like. It's like stepping back into your first day of school and seeing how people have changed or how comfortable you're going to be around them. Okay. Just bring it back to that. That child self is still right there and they're crying out to either be acknowledged or to be with other people. Mm. Absolutely. Paul, this has been really really uplifting and insightful and i really appreciate all the time you've given and um, the last question we ask is just h- how do you take care of your own mental health yeah that is the that is a good one um like i'll open up about it obviously uh, i also care for my partner uh they've got ptsd as well uh high functioning autism as well uh Workplace bullying for them was what the cause was. So work doesn't finish for me really when I, when I fish with clients. I'm there caring for someone as well. So how I look after myself, uh, a lot of walking. Uh, I think the pavement outside has, you know, might have permanent grooves where my foot has walked, you know. <laughs> um, I would chill out to music as best as I can or I would just try and have moments with friends. I would value every single moment that I have that's peaceful as well. 
Uh, I'm constantly checking in on kind of like my workload. If a day was like, if a day was intense or not, um, I do check in on myself physically a lot because when mental health goes down, physical health falls after. So I'm constantly getting like checked in terms of kind of like, you know, anything going on in my system as well. Um, but yeah, it's keeping on top of that, but also supervision. I also have a really good support network around me. Like my supervisor is brilliant, very supportive and, you know, real credit just to, you know, help me through both my client work and also just general advice when it comes to managing you know, my partner as well. You know, us counselors aren't invulnerable, you know, uh, so things can get to yeah. us. But it's, yeah, I do find some peace and detachment from everything as well, you know. So, you know, it's just, yeah, it's some releases, but I'm still kind of also fine tuning it a bit and figuring out as well. That's the constant yeah. journey as well, you know. So I'm not someone who can just chill out and watch Netflix or uh, like that sometimes might be that all I need to do is play a game that I've played a thousand times over because it's familiar, you know, or it might be that I just need to reread a book you know, because it's familiar, but yeah, I find my own spaces for recovery. I kind of adopt the spoon theory approach, you know, where it's like I'm recharging my spoons by doing a practice that I feel safe and comfortable in because I know I've expended a lot of my spoons for that day. You know, a fun theory to look up, you know, it's used for chronic pain, you know, just in terms of, you know, okay. some, some people might wake up spending eight spoons to get out of bed. Some might spend one. So yeah it's looking at it in terms of perspective and resource management uh, i appreciate your honesty paul and mm. it's been a real pleasure having you on uh, i've never heard the spoon theory and i've definitely learned a lot of other things <laughs> throughout these it's a it's a good one minutes. yeah well thank you so much as well it's wonderful to be able to just open up and talk about this as well like you know a lot of people in the profession go unheard because it's a very lonely job as well so it's good to share that insight and perspective yeah, yeah. too you know and hopefully it's a benefit to a lot of people i'm sure it will i'm sure it will uh, and that, that that is one thing that i've been thinking about as well how the 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 holistic health of the people who really who care for a lot of other people really needs to be prioritized you know they're like you said they're carrying a lot of bricks they're really helping a lot of people they they need to be given time and and respect for them to look after themselves as well um and i'm glad to hear that you seem to like you said i mean it's always a work in progress but you seem to have strong foundations in being able to do that because you need to don't you because it can like you said so easily slips so easily slips yeah there's no give or take in it. There's just getting on with it, you know, and just taking a step back when needs to, but, you know, not being like just always trying to move forward progressively in some shape or form. Beautiful. Uh, th thanks so much, Paul. And sorry, just a quick last question. Hypothetically, yeah, somebody's on. listening and say, oh, I, I, I wonder, can I actually do an online session with Paul, even if I'm based in Ireland? Is, is that possible? Yeah. So, uh, Cross, accredit cross accrediting with professional bodies is perfectly fine. Uh, like even though I'm in the UK, I do run uh, like you know I do have Irish clients as well. So yeah. and that's perfectly fine. The, you'll find it with the BACP and IACP, they both accredited like you know they recognize each other. So it's perfectly right. fine to do so. Uh, it's the client's choice as well. You know just to where they access their service as well. You know obviously you know language barriers is what you know prevents some people from going like to like france or spain but you know obviously there's no language barrier between uh, the uk and ireland depending on where you're from you know <laughs> different accents you know <laughs> uh, like i i joke some of my cousins uh like you know over in leicester birmingham i would kind of go what are they saying we're speaking the same language but we're not talking the same words and you know, some of my no, cousins no. as well, like a, lot of my fa a lot of my family from Tipperary, you know, so, you know, I, I do understand some of their inflections. Other people wouldn't. So <laughs> that's what I'm just joking about there. But yeah, no, it's like, that's usually perfectly accepted, you know, once they acknowledge that they're doing that, like, you know, they're accessing services elsewhere, you know, but I do take people both sides. Wonderful. I will be sure to leave the link to your, your profile in the show notes. Okay. Thank you so much, Bob. You're very welcome, okay? Hi, guys. Thank you for listening to the podcast. Please don't forget to subscribe and leave a five-star review if you haven't already. Every review helps us climb the podcast charts so that even more of you can listen to our amazing guests. 
We really appreciate the support. Remember to tune in next week. But until then, keep safe and have a good one. Thank you.